Okay, so we left off talking about the role that ABA plays in seed dormancy, and let's just remind ourselves that there are three stages of um, seed formation. That stage one was embryogenesis. Stage two was um, storage product formation. And the third stage was drying. And we talked about two different roles that abscisic acid play in this. The first role was the role that ABA plays in triggering the formation of these storage products. So it's the trigger that turns on the transcription of the genes that are involved in making these storage products. We also said that it also, at the same time, turns on the formation of other compounds. Um, we referred to them as the LEA genes, late embryogenesis abundant. These are genes that are involved in protecting the embryo while it dries down. So loss of water would normally be fatal for cells, but in the presence of the appropriate protective compounds, drying down completely doesn't, doesn't hurt them. And it's the products that are produced by the enzymes that are encoded in the LEA genes that allow the seed to dry down and then take up water again and regain metabolism. So that's one of the roles is to turn on in stage two or late stage one the formation of these storage products, the LEA genes. But the other, the other role that is played by abscisic acid is to induce dormancy. So we saw in the, um, the picture of the corn cob with the kernels that were starting to germinate already before the seeds had even uh, dried down. We called that vivipary. And that occurs because ABA-induced dormancy is lacking, either because ABA can't be synthesized or because there's something wrong with the signal transduction pathway. And we said that this ABA here that triggers this, this is ABA from the embryo. But the ABA that's doing dormancy, that ABA, at least initially until the seed dries down, is from the maternal tissue. So what would you expect What would you expect if you excised an embryo at the end of stage one? If you excise an embryo from the developing seed, what would you expect that embryo to do? It would, it would try to germinate, right? So, so in the absence of the maternal ABA, an excised embryo will actually germinate. And if you apply exogenous ABA, that prevents the, the um, embryo from germinating. Okay, so that there's two separate roles that ABA are playing here. A developmental role in terms of turn on the production of the right genes for making storage products and, and uh, compatible solutes for drying down the seed, and the ABA from the maternal tissues that um, keeps the seed from germinating, keeps the embryo from germinating, even though the conditions are right. Okay, so what we need to do to finish up the dormancy is to consider how dormancy is maintained in the seed and what's required to break dormancy. So there's actually two types of dormancy that happen in seeds. There's embryo-imposed dormancy. And then there's seed coat-imposed Embryo-imposed dormancy is dormancy that is the embryo is waiting for an appropriate environmental signal in order to allow growth to happen. And most often, that signal is chilling. Sometime during the dormant period, the seed has to expo be exposed to 
low enough temperature that it turns on some pathway that when the seed takes up water, it will germinate. Bells should be going off in your head. What's wrong with the story that I just told you? Wouldn't it die? Okay, so do seeds that require um, cold, if you give them cold but no water, do they do anything? Right, they got to have water and those conditions. But does, do the water and the cold conditions come at the same time typically? Right, so they come separately. Cold comes during the middle of the winter, the water comes in the spring. Uh, but we, at least in upstate New York, we have these like, snow melts. We yeah, have okay. Snow so, yeah, so Unless we have more. Yeah, yeah right. So they're, they're obviously, um, let's say, unusual conditions, or maybe well, right I mean, here. It's unusual are. in most pepper. Like, there are times when snow melts. Yeah. So like that gives it water, so why doesn't it germinate in February? So um, if you had been around here a couple of years ago in February, we I, had, I, we, I heard about it. We had a we had very warm weather, 60 degree yes. weather in February. All the magnolia trees bloomed, and then we got a foot of snow. Right. So yeah, those things happen, and in some places they're more the exception, the rule rather than the exception. But even like if you snow still in the ground, some layers of the snow are melting. Yeah. You know because just because of pressure. So that kind of seeps water to the soil. So okay, so let's step back from what, let, let's, let's treat this in a very idealistic way. Okay. Okay, so the, the, the chilling comes during the winter when water isn't available, and the water becomes available later on. So the chilling, the thing that breaks the dormancy, comes during a time when the seed is in what stage? Is it metabolically active? No. Is there something, bells going off in your head? How does it sense the chilling temperature if the seed is metabolically inactive? There's a receptor. There's yeah, but so what if there's a receptor? There's, there's nothing going on in the cell. The cell is basically, you know, dead. It's not dead, but it's in suspended animation. Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know it's in seeds. Uh, we know that, like for trees, we know it works, but we don't really know. Yeah. Well, that's that's it, the same thing for seeds. So, what it is that's going on during dormancy, and whether we're talking about buds or seeds, what it is that's sensing the chilling temperature. You know, like many times it's like five days or twenty degrees or something like that. How many of you grow rhabdopsis? Nobody grows rhabdopsis. Jeez, that's wonderful. Um, so for rabidopsis, if you're germinating the seeds, the first thing you do is you put them in a cold room for two days. It greatly increases the, the amount of germination of the seeds because the, the seeds require um, that chilling before they'll, they'll germinate. Okay? So I have a question. You can only get metabolic active when there's water present, right? Because Correct. Really yeah, that's right. So, this, the, the sensing of the environmental parameter that's required to break dormancy is happening at a time when the seed is metabolically inactive. That's the, that's the dichotomy. That's the thing that should be going, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. And the same is true for buds on trees. I mean, whether we're talking about buds that are going to produce leaves in the spring or buds that are going to produce flowers in the spring, those buds are produced in the fall. They dry down, they become metabolically inactive, they overwinter, and it's the chilling during the winter that's required when the warmer temperatures come along in the spring for those buds to break. Right? So same problem for seeds and for buds. This chilling imposed, the chilling requirement is sensed at a time when the seed or the bud is metabolic. Is this true for, this can't be true for all the climates, right? For seeds that grow in the uh, tropics? No, obviously seeds that grow in the tropics, it wouldn't do them much good to have right. a chilling so requirement. what do they have? What do they so have? There's, there's other types of dormancy, and there, there are many seeds that have no dormancy. Okay. Right? Dormancy is not an obligate component of the way seeds work. So dormancy is imposed 
during seed formation for good reason. You don't want the seeds to germinate in the maternal tissues. But there are many seeds, once they're dispersed, as soon as they imbibe water, they germinate. Right? Why would a seed not germinate when it imbibes water? What would, why would it make sense for dormancy to be imposed on some seeds? So? Yeah, right? So, you know, if it's not a good time for, for the, um, the, uh, the seed to, seedling to grow, or it could be related to um, the time, that, how long it takes for the, the, the seedling to, to reach reproductive stage, and when the pollinators are going to be present, there could be a lot of timing events that dictate that a seed would wait to germinate rather than germinating right away. Okay? But it doesn't happen all the time. Okay, the other one we want to talk about is seed coat imposed. And this has nothing to do with the embryo. The embryo is basically inside the seed trying to grow. And the mechanical strength of the seed coat is keeping it from growing. So seed coat imposed more often than not is a light dependent process to break seed coat imposed dormancy. And you can get around seed coat imposed dormancy by mechanically damaging the seed coats. So basically, you know, put the seeds in a jar and shake it up, called scarification. Just make, just crack that seed coat a little bit, and then you can get around the seed coat imposed dormancy. Okay? So both of these represent different ways in which the growth of the embryo is restricted until the appropriate environmental conditions have been met. So, Last thing we really want to think about here is what's the role that abscisic acid plays in this. Well, we saw that abscisic acid is playing a role in while the seeds are forming and before they dry down, it's imposing the dormancy. In both of these cases, the imposition or the maintenance of dormancy and the breaking of dormancy are both um, determined by the ratio of gibberellic acid to abscisic acid. So if this ratio is high, it breaks dormancy. And if this ratio is low, it maintains dormancy. It's also true for buds. Because I was working on a semester project, whatever, once, and there are about 50 papers that all say different things about which ratio we have about. Science, I'm sorry, I can't quite well, hear Well, it seemed that the paper, like most authors were not sure. Some would say we need high and low ABH to begin with, and others said it the other way around, and nobody really had data that seemed to support any theory to either side. Well, so whichever side there were four, they had the right data, but the other side <laughs> had the right data. So in other words, there's, there's no agreement that this generality applies to buds. I'm not aware of that, but but I certainly believe you. If, that, if it's something you work on, then it's likely to be, you're, you're, you know more about it than I do. Can we? Um, for um, the seed coat? Is the seed coat like dead tissue? Uh, how would it sense the light? And how would it break, break something? Like what do you think? Is the seed coat dead tissue in a seed? Is the seed coat living tissue? No, it's not. So how would, does the seed coat sense the light? Is it degraded? Um, the seed coat does get degraded. Does the seed coat generate the enzymes that degrade the seed coat? Not if it's dead. Right? It must be cells inside the seed coat that are sensing it. The so light penetrates through the seed coat, induces a signal transduction pathway that produces enzymes that degrade the seed coat and allow the embryo to, to grow through it. Okay. Sorry. Any questions on the role that ABA is playing in dormancy here? All right, with this, all right, let's go on and talk about rasm steroids just briefly. So, what are steroids used for in general? 
So if you're growth or your single transduction, there's a much more common use for steroids than that. Yes? Wait, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear what she said. <laughs> she started to say something and then she said, never mind, so she never really got it out. Come on, what are steroids? They're common components of what parts of cells? Oh, the lipid body. They're lipids, right? Yeah. So it's lipid right. Lipid. Think of cholesterol. Yeah. Right? That's the story. Right? What's, where's cholesterol found in plants and animals? And cholesterol is in plants, but there's not a lot of it. So it is in plants. Yeah. Everybody tells you that there's no cholesterol in plants. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't know what they're talking about. But it's very low. I mean, if you think about you eat a you know a pound of meat, there's a ton of cholesterol in there. You eat a pound of plants and you get, you know, I mean it says trace amounts. It's there. We'll see. It's a it's a it's a um, um, sure. intermediate in the synthesis of grasses steroids. It it can be an intermediate in the synthesis of grass and steroids. So what do steroids do? They're in the membranes. And what do they do in the membranes? Yeah, they maintain fluidity. Right? So um, the presence of steroids works at both the high and low temperature ends. At the high temperature, it keeps the membrane from getting too fluid. And at low temperatures, it keeps the membrane from, from not being fluid enough. So it plays important roles in maintaining the functionality of the membrane over a wide range of temperatures. If you look. In any textbook that's been written before 2008, it tells you that steroids are limited to eukaryotes. This is incorrect. It's now known that steroids are present in many prokaryotes, not in large amounts, not nearly as much as there is in eukaryotes, but there are there are um, steroids that are present in in um, all almost all the groups of prokaryotes that have been looked at. And in fact, some of the groups contain steroid biosynthesis enzymes that are very highly homologous to the steroid biosynthesis enzymes in plants. Okay, why is this important? Why should we care whether steroids are present in prokaryotes or not? It's the E word, guys. Evolution, Evolution right? So if, the, if steroids are present in prokaryotes, what does that tell us? Yeah, so that the eukaryotes probably inherited them from common ancestors, and even more importantly, common ancestors that, that were there before plants and animals diverged from each other. So if steroids are present in bacteria, and their presence in plant animals. And you see steroids that function in maintaining membrane fluidity in plants. And you see the same sorts of steroids that are, that are um, maintaining membrane fluidity in animals. And then you see steroids that act as hormones in animals. What would you logically think? There are steroids that function as hormones in plants. Well, so there wasn't any evidence for that until maybe the um, mid 1980s or so, and uh, there there was some people were looking for compounds that were involved in promoting pollen tube growth, and it turned out that there was a compound in pollen that promoted pollen tube growth that the, the book describes um, as somebody collecting 227 kilograms of bee-collected rapeseed pollen. I don't know how the heck anybody could have done that. You know, it's, it's sort of like the autoclave sperm herring. You know, you just sort of wonder why they actually decided to do that. But they did. They actually kind of from it, and it was a steroid. They, were called, they called them braxins. Brassins are steroids that promote pollen tube growth. So even when these had been isolated, purified, and showed that they promoted pollen tube growth, there was still tremendous resistance to accepting the ideas that steroids function as hormone in plants. 
my physiologist didn't seem to want to go along with that very much. So what do the what are the functions that steroid hormones um, serve in animals? It's basically two categories. Well, that's growth. Um, no, they're not so much involved in growth. What about like estrogen? Yeah, what about estrogen? One of its functions. It, it certainly plays a role in growth, but it plays a very specific role in growth. It's related to sex. So there, there, the many of the. Many of the functions, not all of them, but many of the functions are related to sex. Many of the steroid hormones are sex hormones. Right? They're separate hormones for, um, they control different processes in males and females. What's the other main role that steroid hormones play in, in animals? What's the other main class of steroid hormones? Producing your adrenal glands. Cortisones and things like that. The fight or flight response. They're yeah, they're stress hormones. Stress hormones. They're stress hormones. So, so in animals, you basically have growth, sex, and stress. Um, and what does it turn out that the rest of the steroids do in plants? Well, like you said, promotes pollen tube growth. Pollen tube growth. Sex and growth. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, they do sex and growth. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, if you look at the list of things that, that brass and steroids do, it's pollen tube, it regulates growth, they regulate um, seed germination, they, they regulate a little bit of everything. So, in many senses, the brass and steroids are not a whole lot different than any of the other hormones we talked about. They play a role in a wide range of different functions. Okay, so there's, there's really nothing new there. Now, the... Um, the way that people have basically identified brass and steroids is very similar to what they did with auction. Remember that auction, the bioassay for auction was taking internodes of plants and cutting them up, putting them in a petri dish, and putting in auction to see if they elongate. Right? So that one of the bioassays for, uh, we'll come back to that in a second. There it is. One of the bioassays, boy, that's really dim, isn't it? Uh, I turned the light. No, this is really dim. Can you see that? Okay. Uh, I don't know what's going on with the projector. No, I don't think it's the room. I mean, I can. You guys will just fall asleep if I do that. Can does that help? That helps. Okay. Well, we'll leave it like that. So the two main assays that people use for brass and steroids is taking the second internode of peas, I believe it is. So here's the second internode of peas treated with increasing concentrations of brass and steroids. So you see elongation. Then you see some pretty weird developmental things going on here. But basically, the, the key is the elongation. And that elongation, unlike auxin, where auction only causes elongation of cells, brass and steroids cause both elongation and cell division. Right? So there's a difference in terms of how that elongation is being accomplished. The other one is a slightly more esoteric one. And it's looking at the angle of the second leaf. So basically, at this point right here, the top of the second leaf lamina, you apply some brass and steroids. And as the leaf comes out, the amount of bending depends upon the amount of brass and steroids there. Basically, what the brass and steroids are doing is causing differential cell growth at the top and bottom edges of the leaf. So if it grows more at the top, it bends down more. Right? So these are the two main assays that are used for defining brass and steroids. Okay? So like auxin, then, these compounds are identified by their function in the plants, not necessarily by their chemical structure. But their chemical structure is pretty similar. Oops, here we go. The structure of uh, brass and steroids, these are 
um, steroids are 30 carbon uh, isoprene derived compounds, tri triterpenes. So if they're triterpenes, that made, means that they're made in the cytoplasm and not in the um, plastids. So they all basically have um, this four-membered ring structure. And one of the things I wanted to show you is, can, oh boy, you can't even see that, can you? Can you tell the difference between the red and the blue? Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, here. <laughs> no, yeah, that'll, that'll help a lot, right? Um, the idea was to show you, not, not that I want you to know any detail about this, but so what you've got is two five-carbon precursors, isoprene-derived de precursors, that join together to form, in the case of the, the um, steroids, a 30-carbon intermediate. So you've got this linear thing with alternating single and double bonds and these methyl groups sticking out. And a series of reactions bends this thing up to form four closed rings. So pretty unusual chemistry just happening right there to close that structure up and form these rings. This, this structure here is the basic structure for all steroids. Anna? No, this is the synthesis that happens in plants. It's not exactly the same, but it's very similar. Um, nope, the precursors are the same, but the pathway um, is slightly different in terms of the oxidation steps. And I'll show you what I mean by the oxidation steps in just a minute. So basically, you've got a hydrocarbon here, right? And what happens to convert this into different types of steroids is oxidation of these, putting in hydroxyl groups or, or ketone groups or aldehyde groups into the structure. That's almost all of the, the um, steroids are, are made and distinguished that way. And the enzymes that, that, that catalyze these are ones that I think you've probably heard of. They're cytochrome P450. Monooxygenases. Where do you hear about these? Where do you hear about monooxygenases? Yeah, so one of the things, one of the things these, these um, enzymes are involved with are detoxification of compounds you know, in our bodies. But the other, one of the other places you hear about monooxygenases a lot is in drugs. Many of the drugs that are designed to alter internal metabolism are aimed at changing the ratios of, the, of these different steroids that are present in, in your body. No, it is a cytochrome, so it is a protein with a heme in it, but it's not involved in the respiratory or photosynthetic electron transport chain. But it is, being a monooxygenase, what that means is it's sticking a single oxygen. It's usually making a hydroxyl group in there. So it is an essentially an electron transport, little mini electron transport system. Okay? So these are the key enzymes that are involved in the formation of the steroids, and I'm not going to go into any gory detail here, but here's the synthetic pathway. And um, there are mutants that have been identified in every one of these steps in the synthesis of the Brassens steroids in Arabidopsis. So they basically have nailed every step in steroid biosynthesis in Arabidopsis by analysis of, of mutants. And remember, these would all be mutations that would be, could be, recovered by exogenous application of brass and steroids. The problem is not in the sensing of the brass and the steroids, but in the synthesis of it. Okay. So one of the things that, that distinguishes the brass and steroids from virtually all the other hormones that are present in plants is that they are active at lower concentrations. You know, so here's a, uh, a figure that's looking at the, the leaf angle um, assay 
as a function of the amount of brass and steroid that's being applied. And you can see that it's sensitive down there in the range of hundreds of nanograms. So very low amounts of the compound allow the response to be, to be seen. Why is this? What, what must be different about brass and steroids compared to auxins or cytokinins that would account for this? How about you, Patrick? What would, why, what would, what would account for the difference in the sensitivity? No? James? More receptors? Will more receptors make it more sensitive? Mike? Different yeah, different binding affinities, right? I mean, remember, the, all the, the requirement f to trigger the signal transduction pathway is the binding of the signaling molecule to the receptor, right? All this is saying is that for the brass and the steroids, the affinity of binding is much higher. Lower concentrations allow it to bind. If you have more receptors, wouldn't there be kind of more chance, like, you know, for the ligand to bind to the receptor? And if you only have, like, say, two receptors, you have less chance of them binding because it's, I mean, it's random. There's nothing like take it and put it in at the receptor. But is the binding concentration dependent? So if you're below the binding affinity, Right. Concentration below the binding affinity, will more or less no, receptors help? Okay. So there will be a range in the, uh, the, the signal concentration where differences in the receptor number of receptors will make a difference. We talked about that when we talked about the ethylene receptors. But in general, it's the binding affinity that's going to be the key thing. What is binding affinity? Remember that? Well, I'll like remind yourself what this is. So we're going to make the plot of percent bound for the signaling molecule as a function of the concentration of the signal. And let's just do this correctly and let's do it as the log of the concentration of the signal. And you get a curve that looks like this. If you plot it on a linear scale, it's the normal curve that we see like that. Right? So this point at which 50% is bound, we define as the binding affinity. So if something has a high binding affinity, then more of it will be bound at lower concentrations. It has a lower binding affinity, then it takes more higher concentration for it to bind. Right? So what determines the binding affinity? What determines the binding affinity? What determines the binding affinity? Say that again? Yeah, so what about the receptor? Mm, yeah, it could be related to the activation. I'm just looking for something much more general. Yeah, where it binds, the structure of the site where it binds, right? So could we, for example, one of the questions that somebody asked today on the, um, the general questions about, about hormones, can you alter the affinity of the receptor for the signaling molecule? Yes. How do we know that that must be the case? How do we know that that must be the case? I mean, by one, the protein. Okay, so the receptor is a protein. So when you can change what well, other proteins can bind to other proteins by changing the conformation, and plus there's also, I mean, there have been studies where they, like, negative and positive, act, uh, I don't know what the word is, activators? Like, where you have a second, second protein bind to the first protein. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a protein, it could oh, be anything, right? Yeah. So we, we talk about that in terms of allosteric regulation of enzymes, right? So you think about allosteric regulations, you get an active site where the substrate binds in some other place where some other molecule binds that changes the affinity of the active site. Could you do the same thing with a hormone? Could a receptor bind something else in some other place 
that would change the affinity of the, the binding site for the signaling molecule? Yeah. Absolutely. So does this provide a mechanism by which two signal transduction pathways, signal transduction pathways for two different hormones could interact with each other? Yeah. Have we seen examples of this? The answer is yes. <laughs> if you remember what those were, think about um, leaf abscission. Oxygen and ethylene. And what about oxygen and ethylene? So is the is abscission, as the leaf senesces, oxygen production in the leaf goes down. And that oxygen, decrease in oxygen from the leaf to the petiole causes what to happen in the no, it's not ethylene production. Changes in the sensitivity to ethylene, right? So changes in the sensitivity of the ethylene can be accomplished by the same mechanism we talked about for allosteric regulation of enzymes, changing the affinity of the substrate for or the, of the signaling molecule for its receptor. Yeah, and that's a, one of the common ways that signal transduction pathways interact. Is by changing the one signal transduction pathway, changing the affinity of another signal transduction pathway for the signal molecule. So you're doing the actual binding site? Yeah. Yeah, so if the protein conformation changes, that conformational change could make it bind more tightly or more loosely the signaling molecule. So it's not something where you have two different receptors and then maybe like the. Um, um, well, the oxygen receptor, the pathway that comes down from that. Yeah, I, I, I mean, ethylene's I, pathway is somehow conflicting with oxygen's pathway, like, you know, degrading the double protein or something like that. Let's make a model. Here's the ethylene receptor. Here's the oxygen receptor. So there's some sort of oxygen signal transduction pathway, you know, that's got a bunch of different steps in it. We want to define what those steps are. But one of those steps then comes back, not the oxygen itself, but something from the oxygen signal transduction pathway, comes back and interacts with the ethylene receptor to change the binding affinity of ethylene at the receptor. Okay, so it's not oxygen and ethylene interacting at the same molecule. It's some downstream component of the oxygen signal transduction pathway. In the case that we talked about for abscission, it's the, the, um, the absence of oxygen makes them more sensitive. So it must be the absence of oxygen takes away some molecule that was limiting the sensitivity of the oxygen or of the ethylene receptor. So when oxygen goes down, the ethylene receptor becomes more sensitive to and the abscission zone goes through its thing and the leaf falls off. Okay, so it's not, it's got to be something indirect via the oxygen signal transduction pathway that's regulating this. Does that make sense? It's not oxygen itself that's binding to the ethylene receptor. It's some component of the oxygen signal transduction pathway. I guess my question was how do you know that it's the ethylene receptor that is being regulated, not, not some sort of how would you, that's a good question. What would you do to ask if it's ethylene receptor or something else in the, in the ethylene pathway that's being regulated? Is that what you're asking? What would you do? It's a good exam question. What would you do? Somehow label some product from um, I'm not trying to explain that a little bit more. If I know that the IAA receptor produces something that uses carbon, for example. Yep. Carbon backbone, I can maybe add some kind of label carbon. Okay, so what is, what, so you're going to monitor the amount of label in that? Yeah. But how does that, how does that tell you about what's going on with the ethylene pathway? I don't know, maybe then in the abscission zone it will accumulate. Or it might bind to the ethylene receptor. Yeah. The label compound could bind to the ethylene receptor. But remember, what we want to ask is, is this affecting the ethylene receptor or is it affecting something further down in the pathway? 
that if it's happening, we just have to do work with the things downstream from it. Work out. Okay, so if you had it where it was always on and the bottom of the ethylene receptor, and if you did it that way, then that could work. There's a simpler way. You're, you guys are missing the easy one. It's right here on the board. You do an experiment in the presence or absence of oxygen, and you vary the concentration of ethylene, and you look at the response. If it's the receptor, the sensitivity to ethylene will change. If it's somewhere down in the pathway, the sensitivity to ethylene will not change. What did you do? Yeah. Okay, so let's imagine that what we're looking at here is leaf abscission versus ethylene concentration, right? So when the when the um, when the, before the leaf starts senescing, we take the leaf and we expose it to different levels of ethylene. No, different levels of ethylene. Remember, what we're testing is, is the ethylene receptor's sensitivity, binding affinity for ethylene, changing as a function of oxygen concentration. Right? So, in a normal leaf, what's the concentration of oxygen? Relatively compared to a senescing leaf? Higher, right? Okay, so we got high oxygen, we do this experiment, and we see how much ethylene it takes to induce abscission. Now we let the leaf senesce, or we inhibit oxygen synthesis in the leaf, and we repeat the experiment, again, changing the concentration of ethylene. And if we see the curve shift to lower concentrations, the only way we can account for that is by, because the only thing that ethylene is interacting with is this receptor. It's not interacting with anything down here, anything over here. And so if we change the sensitivity of the ethylene receptor, then that would be that would be proof that it's <coughs> interacting with the receptor and not something further down the signal or such. You guys should be able to figure that out. You should you should understand enough about what's going on in the signal transduction pathway to be able to sort that out. Okay, let's go back to brass and steroids for just a second. So I think there's uh, yeah. So if we look at mutants. I'm not going to focus, focus on this too much. But there's two common characteristics of brassosteroid mutants that are shown in these pictures. Wild type mutant, wild type mutant. The mutants are t typically a lot smaller. So brassosteroids have something in general to do with growth. But the more obvious phenotype is when we compare wild type dark grown seedlings with. Uh, mutants in the brass and steroid synthesis or response pathway. The wild type seedlings when they're grown in the dark have all the normal characteristics. Long hypocotyls, presence of hooks, no primary leaves. If you look at brass and steroid mutants, they look as if they're grown in the light. They have short, thick hypocotyls. They have no hook. The cotyledons open up. Primary leaves are forming. It's as if the phytochrome had been activated. So a possible question that one could ask on a final exam would be to compare what's happening in a brass and a steroid mutant with what's happening in um, normal wild type plants when, you, when phytochrome has been activated. What are the things that must be going on in order to give you this phenotype? I'm not looking for gory details, but you should be able to explain to me what are the similarities and what are the differences in these two situations. Okay, the last thing I want to say about brass and steroids, oh, I do want to say one thing about signal transduction pathway. So brass and steroids are um, probably of all the plant hormone signal transduction pathways, the ones that we have the most complete picture. Um, so that we pretty much know all the components of the pathway and what's going on here. One of the most interesting parts of the brass and steroid pathway are the receptors. The receptors belong to a very large family in Arabidopsis, and, and they're typically large families in all organi organisms, of what are called leucine-rich repeat receptors. So these little brown thing or blue things stacked up here are regions that are rich in leucine, amino acids, that are repeated 
So in brass and steroids, there's something like 25 of these repeats. And these are always on the extracytoplasmic surface facing outside the cell. This is always where the, res um, the binding site for the, for the signaling molecules are. So I think in, in Rabidopsis, they said there's something on the order of 250 different genes that encode leucine-rich repeat receptors in Arabidopsis. Interestingly, only one of them is known to in be involved with brass and steroids. Right? So what are the other 249 of them doing? Are they steroid receptors? Are they other types of receptors? I don't know the answer to that. Um, but considering the ubiquity of steroid hormones in a number of different pathways, I wouldn't be surprised that there are other brass and steroid dependent receptors in there. But if you look at the signal transduction pathway, for example, you should be able to tell me um, where, where the positive and where the negative control elements here. Right? So like most of the plant pathways, there are negative control elements in the brass and steroid signaling pathway. You should be able to identify where that is. I don't care that you know all the details of this. It's the same as everything else. But you should be able to look at this and have an idea of what's going on and be able to compare it with the other hormones that we've been talking about. Okay, last thing I want to say is about brass and steroid transport because this is pretty different. So um, we know that brass and steroids are, are necessary for normal growth. So the, one of the simple experiments was done with simple grafting experiments. So take a um, brass and a steroid deficient shoot and graft it onto normal wild type roots. The, que the question that's being asked is can brass and steroids that are being produced normally in the roots recover the normal growth of the shoots? And the answer is clearly no. This plant is short, right? You can do the opposite experiment. You can say, does a brass and a steroid um, deficient root alter the growth of the shoot? And the answer is no. So the take home message from this is that there doesn't seem to be any long distance transport of brass and steroids. At least it doesn't seem to be involved in uh, any of the major developmental processes. So another thing that distinguishes brass and steroids from the rest of the hormones, ethylene is probably a little bit like brass and steroids, but for different reasons. Remember we talked about ethylene, you can't contain it in a cell. It's very membrane permeable, it's um, gaseous so that it can escape into the air pretty easily. But brass and steroids seem to be functioning almost entirely locally. Right? So the picture of transport in and transport out plays much less role in brass and steroids than it does in any of the other hormones. So wherever brass and steroids are made, you can expect that their function is going to be nearby, diffusion distance away, and not long distance transport away. So what does that mean about where brass and steroids are made in plants? They're made locally, but are they, so is brass and steroid synthesis restricted to specific parts of the plants? Probably not, right? If it's involved in all sorts of different things and there's no transport of it, then it's got to be the potential to make brass and steroids has to be pretty evenly distributed in the plant. Basically, the only part of the plant that doesn't make much brass and steroids are fruits. Everything else has the capacity to make brass and steroids. Okay, so I told you it was going to be short. We're going to stop there. And get you guys awake again. Sorry. We'll spend the rest of the time going over some of the questions that you submitted this morning.
And I, I'm not going to attribute questions to anybody. If you want to acknowledge that it was your question, good or bad, that's fine. But I'm not going to say who, who submitted these. So I'm just going to read them off, and then we'll talk about them. I, and I want you guys to give me the answers. I don't, I don't want to do it. To what extent is the presence of hormones dictated by the environment, and to what extent is the hormonal activity pre-programmed genetic response? It seems that many hormones are controlled by external factors such as light or physical damage to the plant, as is the case with oxen. In contrast, others seem to be completely determined by the genetic code. Does this dichotomy contribute a great deal to which hormone plays a certain role or the speed with which a hormone is dispersed? Okay, so there's a lot of parts to this. So the first one is, to what extent is the presence of hormones dictated by the environment and to what extent is hormonal activity pre-programmed genetic response? Who wants to take a crack at that? Are there hormones that are synthesized in response to environmental change? Yes. Yeah, we know that for sure, right? Are there hormones that are synthesized to control development? Yes. Okay. What's the difference between those two? What's the difference between a hormone that's being turned on in response to light or wounding or whatever versus a hormone that's being produced as a part of a regular developmental sequence? What's the difference in the regulation here? One word answer. Differentiation of cells. Well, that's more than one word, but that's okay. Um, well, is, are you talking about what's the response of, to the hormone? I'm talking about what's the difference in the question is related to um, hormones, the presence of hormones being dictated by the environment versus the presence of hormones being dictated by uh, a developmental sequence. So, transcription of genes, like when transcription occurs? Okay, so can, can physical environmental changes alter the transcription of genes that involve hormone synthesis? Yeah. Can Developmental sequence alter the transcriptions of genes that turn on or turn off the formation of hormones? Yes. Okay, so the one word answer to describe the difference between those two is none. Right? <laughs> right. No, do you see what I mean? Don't treat those as being different from each other. There are they themselves are signal transduction pathways, right? It's some, something that's being sensed to make a hormone. It's, it's, it may just be within a single protein or something like that. It's fighting mode. But yeah, it's just you can have responses to abiotic signals or responses to signals that lead to the production or to the changes in the distribution or transport of a hormone. Are all of those genetically controlled, or are some of them not genetically controlled? They're all controlled genetically, right? Because look at, to know whether or not to make the hormone, the cell has to have this, the sensing machinery, sense the light, or sense the developmental environment to make the hormone, right? Don't treat those as being any different from each other. They're exactly, they're, they're, it, it, in the end, they're serving the same purpose. It's just what, what signals being sensed is different. So we don't want to make we don't really want to make any distinction at that level. So is there a dichotomy here in terms of the control of hormones by the environment versus the internal control of hormones associated with development? Not really. No, none. Okay, next one. Throughout the past few weeks, we have learned that signal transduction is not linear, but rather a very interwoven web of pathways. Yes? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's the question? Yeah, I haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> for, just, for just about any kind of plant development, there are usually many hormones acting at the same time. It appears that many of the hormones interact with each other, such as gibril and ABA. These aren't the only two, though. And it seems like the entire plant is playing somewhat of a balancing act between them all. How is it that one hormone pathway can interfere with the other? Well, there was, we talked about one, right? So that was where one hormone 
and alter the sensitivity to another hormone? Is that the only way that two hormone signal transduction pathways can interact? No. Give me another example. Maybe one hormone pathway can cut down precursors for another pathway. What do you mean by precursors? Well, maybe they do stuff to say back to all um, well, so I'm not quite sure what, what precursors of what? Well, of the products that are synthesized from the pathway that the hormone. Oh, okay. So it's affecting the pathway in terms of affecting the output of the product somewhere further down. Sure, that could happen. So if the output of a pathway was synthesizing starch and some other pathway altered the, the production of triosphosphate, yeah, okay. Yeah, that would work. Could it affect the transcription? Yeah, yeah. So could two pathways have? Let's let's step back. When we talk about transcription factors, how many transcription factors can bind upstream of the transcription start site and regulate that transcription? Lots, right? So could could an auxin dependent transcription factor bind? to uh, promote a region and, sh and lower the transcription of that gene or raise the transcription of that gene? Yeah, right? So there's another way they can interact. So it could be interacting through downstream of the products, affecting the distribution of precursors for those products, and <coughs> regulation at any step in the signal transduction pathway, right? Because you can imagine that, that Receptor number one, and here's receptor number two. And there's several paths, several things going on here, but then that there's one component of receptor number two that interacts with a component of receptor number one signal transduction pathway in the middle of the pathway to increase or decrease. Let's say maybe it's a, it's a kinase, right? If you increase the activity of the kinase. You're going to get more phosphorylated intermediates in a bigger response. If you decrease the activity of the kinase, it will go the other way. So there's lots of different ways that, that signal transduction pathways can interact with each other. But you should be able to identify them, not specifically, but in a general sense. You should be able to give me an experiment that would evaluate whether or not two signal transduction pathways interact in some specific way, simply by understanding what are the range of things that are possible? We've pretty much got them. Affect the receptor, affect some component of the signal transduction pathway, affect something related to transcription, or affect something related to the formation of products by changing the amount of uh, substrates that are available. Affect the signal? Could it affect the signal? It depends what the signal Could it? Is. If it's light. Could it? Yes. Are there any examples of that? I'm not, I'm, I'm, I don't know. That's there's a good like question. With oxygen, cytokinase, there's, it increases cytokinase and oxygen. Yeah, okay, that's right. right. So you can affect the breakdown, of, that's exactly right. So you can affect the breakdown of some of those, of those signaling molecules. Yeah, so the, the, the whole role of sort of, um, how does this differ from hormone homeostasis? What do we mean by what do we mean by homeostasis? What does that term mean? Keeping things constant, right? So when we talk about hormone homeostasis, we're talking about keeping the amount of hormone or the amount of hormone response constant. How does that typically happen? How do you keep a response relatively constant? Or keep the amount of hormone relatively constant? Feedback, yeah, and negative or positive feedback. Yeah, positive feedback, you can't regulate things because it, it, just, it just spirals up, right? But negative feedback can keep things at a constant level. So if you think about negative feedback in a signaling pathway, that negative feedback could also affect anything along the way, including, as Stephen pointed out, degrading some of, if there's too much signal, degrading some of the signal. Yeah, good. Okay. What is the difference between the initial, primary, short-term effects of a hormone and the long-term, secondary effects? How do these effects differ among the hormones that we learned about? Okay, so let's not 
Let's not worry about individual hormones. But when we talk about the short-term or initial effects versus the long-term or secondary effects, what are we talking about, just in general? And early and late genes? Yeah, early and late genes. And so if we're going to define how early, how control of early and late gene expression differ, what would be the main thing that you would focus on? If you want to compare the control of expression of early and late genes, what's going to be the biggest difference there? Transcription factors being present versus not already Yeah, that's basically it. So the early genes, the ones that are made right away, the transcription factors are there. They're just somehow inactivated, right? So the signal transduction pathway comes down, turns on the transcription factor, and then those genes are transcribed. What are the products of the transcription of the early genes? What are the genes encoded for the early genes? What's the most common thing they encode? Transcription factors for what? For the late genes. That's basically it. Yeah. Right? So the early genes, the transcription factors are there. They just need to be turned on. Signal transduction pathway turns them on. The products of the early genes, they, they may be structural proteins. You know, it could be enzymes and stuff like that. But more often than not, they are signal transduction, they are transcription factors, which then control a large number of genes that get turned on. Why do we need this second step? Why don't we just have the transcription factors that controls all those you know, 100 genes being inactive and the signal transduction pathway just turn that transcription factor on? Too expensive. Too expensive? In what sense? Like, to have all this, all this um, molecules present. You need a lot of those signal transduction, sorry, you need a lot of those transcription factors yeah. to be sitting around in an inactive state. Yeah. And also, like, whatever is attached to them to keep them inactive. Yep, yep. So it would be, be more expensive to, to keep all of those inactive and to activate them all. Yep. Anything else? Safety. Safety in what sense? <laughs> uh, if I just have a signal that would automatically turn everything on, then there would be no in between control step. I can okay. make sure that I really want that to happen. But now, that's a, that's a good question. So now imagine that you have a mutation. We have the normal early and late genes. And you have a mutation that affects the early gene, the, the early pathway that turns on the, that transcription factor. Isn't the result the same? They all get turned on from a single mutation. In other words, if the if the tra the single transduction pathway so here's the receptor and here's the transcription factor that's inactive. It gets converted to active. by the signal transduction pathway. And then this active goes over here and turns on, you know, binds to a gene and turns on the transcription of those genes. If you have a mutation here that turns this pathway on, it's going to make the transcription factors that are going to go on and make those other genes anyway. So whether you have the single control or the sort of double control, a mutation in this pathway is going to have the same effect. Um, Maybe sometimes it's advantageous to have a time delay. Advantageous to have a time delay. Yeah, that's that's a good one. So don't don't make all those genes right away. Wait a certain amount of time. That 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 could be. Can you think of an example? Maybe like what we're talking about the seeds. Like um, maybe the chilling causes something initially. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a more complicated one yeah, because you've got no metabolism going on there. But I, I can't think of any examples off the top of my head either, but that certainly would be something reasonable. Maybe flowering or something? Maybe um, it's, we know we need four weeks of sunlight before we can yeah. flower or something that the first sunlight initiates it and then it takes a while. Yep. Yep, that could be, that would be a reasonable example. 
Okay, how about this one? Compare how the four different kinds of mutations can give rise to dysfunctionalities in the signal transduction pathways of the different hormones. What are the four different types of mutations? This, this you really should know. I mean, no, no, not that kind of. I'm talking about four different alterations in the signal, signal transduction pathway that changes the outcome of the pathway. That's it. That's it. Right. So positive net regulator always on or always off. Negative regulator always on or always off. Okay. You sh that 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 you should have that uh, because that is every signal transduction pathway that we've talked about has positive and negative regulators in it. Every signal transduction pathway that we've talked about. The identification of most of the components of that signal transduction pathway has been through the analysis of mutants. Right? So this is basically how this is done. You should understand it. The only thing I don't want you to worry about, I think I mentioned this at some point, was don't worry about the dominant and semi-dominant and recessive characteristics. I mean, if you understand genetics, then, then you have no problem with this. I just don't want to take the time. It's relatively it's not beyond your ability to understand. It just takes a while to explain. So we're just going to be not going to pay any attention to it for now. But you don't need that to, to understand what's going on. So you should be able to, I should be able to give you any scenario, and you should be able to take these four different types of possibilities for mutations and tell me which one is the most likely. It seems like many of the plant hormones we have studied are acids or are formed from acids. And we saw that from excited, for excisic <laughs> acid, in particular, this makes it easy for it to cross the membrane and accumulate in the cytoplasm. Why then would the receptor uh, molecules, receptor proteins, be on the plasma membrane? It seems like most of the hormone receptors are not very well understood. But for some, such as ADA, the candidate receptors are in the plasma membrane. Okay, so if a, if a hormone is membrane form permeable, what would there be any any reason to have the receptor on the plasma membrane? This is a this is a really nice question. No, but you asked the question. So, okay, so let's assume that a signaling molecule is membrane permeable. It can go across the plasma membrane, no, no transporters, no nothing. Okay? So does the receptor have to be present on the plasma membrane? No. no. It can be cytoplasmic. It could be in the ER, it could be in the cytoplasm, it could be in the nucleus. Okay. Is there any reason that you might want to have it on the plasma membrane rather than internally? Oh. Might be like Faster, and faster, and larger likelihood to bind. Yeah. Um, the area, like everything that enters the cell, has to pass this membrane. So I don't. Like, it'd be easier to catch things. I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I have to do, do a little statistical simulation to see whether that's the case. But I can think of another reason. Grace, were you going to say something? Um, well, you would be able to increase the concentration. I would be able to have higher concentration. Okay, so the best you could do would be, if it's just diffusion, would be to have equal concentrations inside and outside. But if it's diffusing in them, you expect there to be more outside than inside. Is this the case for the question that we just talked about? You're shaking your head no. Why? No, because it changes its form because the inside of the cell is... That's right. So for uh, um, a hormone like ABA, will the concentration inside and outside be the same under any conditions. But why not? Only because it doesn't diffuse back out. Only because it's changed. Yeah, why not? Why doesn't it diffuse back out? Because it's negative charge. And why does it have a negative charge in the cytoplasm and not in the apoplast? Because it's basic inside the cell. Yeah, because it's more, the pH is different. It's more basic inside the cell. 
So now, take that information. Now we've decided that it's not an equal distribution between inside and outside the cell. Why might, just completely teleologically, we're not looking for any specific examples. What might be the reason to have the receptor outside the cell? There might be more of the molecules. Okay, well, so all of the, if all of the, the molecules that we've talked about are acids, we haven't any, had any that are bases, right? If they're acids, where are they going to accumulate? More outside or more inside? Inside, right? Remember that if they're acidic, they when they move from a more acidic region across the membrane to a less acidic region, they deprotonate, they get charged, and then they can't move back out, so they accumulate in regions that have higher pH in the cytoplasm compared to outside the cell. Right? So why might it be beneficial to have the, the receptor on the plasma membrane? Where what what space is a plasma membrane receptor sensing the concentration in? Inside the cell or outside the cell? So could you imagine in some strange scenario that it would be more important to sense what's outside than what's inside? Most of them. It, it might be, yeah. Or maybe you want to have receptors in both places and have something that's comparative or something like that. Okay, so. Um, there's another important reason why you might think that receptors may be more likely to be in the plasma membrane than in the cytoplasm. Mm -hmm. if, say that again? Sorry, speed speed might be part of it, although if you think about it, if so things, things, are, things diffuse around cells once it gets inside the cell in a matter of seconds, so that's probably not going to be a, a big thing. Uh, are most hormones and I'm thinking now in an evolutionary sense. Are most hormones membrane permeable or impermeable? Are most signals membrane permeable or impermeable? Impermeable, right? So in an evolutionary sense, where would you expect receptors to have evolved to function? Plasma membrane, right? So there could simply be evolutionary constraints that, the, the, that they stay in the plasma membrane. Remember, if they're in the plasma membrane, then they also have to be in internal membranes in the eukaryote, right? There are no, there's no protein synthesis in the plasma membrane. Any receptor that's going to function in the plasma membrane is synthesized in the ER and goes through Golgi and all the vesicles to get to the plasma membrane. And we saw that that turned out to be important for oxygen receptors, right? That's a mechanism of moving them around. And we saw that oxygen receptors in the ER play a different role in signaling than the oxygen receptors in the plasma membrane. Okay, um, I'll send this list around to you. Let me just read um, one more I wanted to do. Okay, I was wondering what would be the effect on other hormones if there's a mutation in the auxin pathway. So either an increase or in the production of the concentration of auxin or a decrease in that production. So we're not talking about eliminating auxin. What are we, what's an auxin? Uh, what's a plant that can't make oxygen? Dead. Dead, right? You got a dead oxygen. Okay? For changing the relative concentrations, would that affect other hormones? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's lots of interactions between oxygen and other hormones by the mechanisms that we just talked about. Okay, I'll send this around to all of you so that you can take a look at it. Um, all the questions are on, on here you should be able to, to answer. There's none on here that are that you shouldn't have to be able to formulate a general answer. If I want something specific, if I want something that tells me what are the actual components that are functioning in this pathway, I'll tell you that. Otherwise, you should assume that I'm looking for an answer that's completely general. Right? That could work for any specific.